this tape here, I, I believe it's, uh, what is it, too cool we got? The late 90s and early 2000s okay. were a golden period for tag team wrestling in WWE. Oh. But with the rise of units such as the Hardy Boys, the Dudley Boys, and Edge and Christian. But of course, a division needs more than just high-flying main event acts to thrive. Because when it comes wow. down to it, someone's got to fill that feel-good mid-card comedy spot. And that's exactly yeah. what Too Cool did. Yes, while other teams were busy climbing the ladder towards success, Grandmaster Sexay, Scotty Too Hotty, and Rikishi were dancing their way there instead. But how did the group come together? And how did their journey go once they formed? Well, join us today as we take a deep dive into their entire story from start to finish in Turn It Up, The Too Cool Story. But first, some backstory. Before they were a trio, Brian Christopher, Scott Taylor, and Rikishi Fatu were all on their own separate career paths, with each trying their best to make it to the top of the wrestling world. That's true. And for Scott's part, this would see him spending eight years working his way up the New England indie scene, starting from the bottom as part of the ring crew, and wow. even supplementing his income by getting a job Scotty as a bank lives. teller for a while. Come 1991, though, he would have managed to get an in with WWE, <laughs> the and he would begin appearing there as enhancement talent, Scotty, what happened spending to the, the next six years after that losing to the likes of the Berserker, oh, wow. Yokozuna, and the Ringmaster. Scotty, you got to and this would all ultimately stone. lead to him getting a full-time job with Vince McMahon's Federation in 1997, Man. where he would immediately find himself getting slotted into the burgeoning light heavyweight division. Joining him in this division, as it happened, would be Brian Christopher, who, despite having to work his way up from the bottom in the United States Wrestling Association for nine years prior to this as well, had something Jacked of an easier up, time, Master. as he was the son of legendary Memphis wrestling figure and, at the time, WWE uh, commentator Jerry the King Lawler. The and this relationship right would there. see him be put in early feuds with the likes of Jeff Jarrett, uh, Bill Dundee, Tom Pritchard, and even his dad himself while down in Tennessee with this helping him to develop quicker than the average performer of his age. Of course, on screen in WWE, however, the fact that he and Lawler were related was supposed to be kept a secret, <laughs> even if it was one of the worst kept secrets in the industry. So with that in mind then, when Brian started rising up to the top of the light heavyweight division in 1997 after having gotten a job with the company, his father would always be there on commentary to sing his praises, all while simultaneously denying he was any relation to him at all. But for all the success angle. both the young Lawler and the New England native were having as cruiserweights at this time, there was a definite limit on what could be achieved there, as just like the parallel division WCW was running at the time, once you were okay. tagged as being anything... Let's pause that right there. So I want to tap on, we just got a chance to see just little editing part of the single career of Scotty and the single career of uh, Grandmaster. You know, in their own right, I feel, and this is uh, just my, you know, my opinion, uh, that these two here can definitely hold their own as a single uh, competition wrestler. You know, uh, most of their lives, uh, you, you know, watching, you know, a lot of their footage that, you know, they, they held their own as single uh, competitors in the ring. Um, given the right opportunity, I feel, <laughs> These cats here could have, you know, uh, could have could have excelled to higher levels in, in, in the industry, and uh, could have, you know, probably mixed it up with the best. As you can see, you know, they have already with Scotty and Stone Cold, and of course, uh, Grandmaster, you know, around his father. So, you know, that's that's my take on these two, and I was so happy that finally, when we did uh, get a chance to hook up. You know, we really, really got to know each other. But I'll tell that story as we go down the line. All right, let's roll tape. Thing less than a heavyweight, you were never going to make it to the upper card and were certainly never going to achieve a main event spot. So realizing they would have oh. to do something to give themselves an extra boost then, Taylor and Christopher teamed up together yeah. for the first time in early 1998 during the tag said, never team battle royal at WrestleMania 14, hoping that by combining their powers there, they would help each other rise to the top of the division. And this unit would quickly prove to be fruitful for them. You know, let me let me go ahead and Taylor. pause on that, just so I can kind of com uh, comment on what this guy has said about you know. It seems like I don't want. I, let me see. I don't want this for you guys to think that it was Scotty and Grandmaster why they never risen to that next level in professional wrestling. You know, you have what it's called uh, those that creative service or creative control that 
kind of kind of writes your you know your storyline and you know uh what they feel that you know with Vince McMahon what your character should be and should not be but you know at the end of the day is those that are hired by uh by the you know big companies to kind of you know write storylines or write characters you know for these different wrestlers that come through so it's not necessarily always the wrestler's fault just so you guys know it doesn't matter to where the level of each professional wrestler when you have those that are behind the scenes writing that you know they're given that that power to write for this person write for that person sometimes they need to fire those sons of bitches <laughs> because if you can't figure out what to do with a good talent like scotty too hottie and grandmaster sexy then your ass need to be fired okay roll the tape initially playing more of the straight man to Christopher's egotistical antics, they would start entering into feuds with other heavyweight teams. And soon after that, seeing how over his partner was getting, Scott would start acting more flamboyantly too, as they each morphed into too sexy Brian Christopher and too hot Scott Taylor yeah, too much. Right but team. as if that wasn't enough to help them get noticed by fans, around this time, Jerry Lawler would even get in on the fun too, as he further teased everyone with his association towards Christopher by helping them to win a tag team match at the June 28th King of the Ring against the unique duo of Al Snow and his famous mannequin friend Ed, with his kayfabe reasoning for this being that he was feuding with Snow at the hey, time. Shout out to Al Snow, one of my victory. good friends. You know? After that and the new team's feud with Al Snow would continue on for a while with the former ECW star finding a new partner in fellow Extreme alumni to Cold Scorpio, with this union being enough to help hey, him get revenge to against too much at September 27th's worker. breakdown in your house. And and while this may have been somewhat of a blow to them at the time, the cocky heels would quickly bounce back by picking up wins against the likes of the Headbangers, the Oddities, and the DOA. There's another good but if you're wondering team. why it was those particular teams they were facing at this time, it was because this was right before the division would blossom into the TLC era, a period when tag team wrestling became every bit as important as singles under Vince McMahon's so before Big that happened, Too Cool would be forced to contend with duos that might have seemed lesser by comparison, with them doing an admirable job of helping to keep the division afloat at this time, all while fans waited for things to really kick off over the next couple of years. That said, any success they were having would temporarily be stalled soon after this when Man, Christopher tore a guy. ligament in his leg that saw him have to go on the shelf for the next five months. And so, not wanting to let their momentum slow down then, while his partner was away recuperating, Taylor would continue to build their gimmick by beginning to incorporate breakdancing moves into his matches, with the most notable of these being the Worm. Well, there's the Worm. Which, as okay. time went on, would become as over as any other move on WWE TV, always drawing huge reactions whenever it was called for. This guy and wanting to develop this further this upon his return like to action in June of 1999, of Christopher would convince his partner to rebrand themselves once more, with the Memphis boy this time morphing into Grandmaster Sex A and Taylor <laughs> becoming Scotty <laughs> Too Hottie, two delusional and dorky hip hop aficionado heels who believe themselves to be the coolest people in the world Aye, and the, the object of Scotty. desire for women everywhere. And so hey, cool so did they feel they were. Hold on that on so I've, I've just seen Scotty uh, with his hair like that. So just an inside story, man. Scotty used to be just so, like, all the time when he get ready, when we used to be backstage, like, he'd be so busy, like, trying to put, I think it was gel, uh, more gel to keep that thing, because his hair normally just lays flat. But when he, you know, has to stand, to, stand his hair up, you know, I'd sit there and I'd watch him put gel in there, maybe more gel, and possibly maybe a whole bottle of, bottle of hairspray to keep that damn thing pointed up in the air. And so, I don't know, he came up with a hell of an idea where, because during the match, you know, all of a sudden his hair started falling through. So he came up with an idea, the bucket hat. You guys remember the bucket hat? He, were cut, he cut a hole in the bucket hat, put it on first, did the spray and the gel, and then pulled the bucket hat up with, you know, help stand, have his hair kept standing up like that. And it was pretty cool. When it was a good look, you know, but it was a lot, a lot of work for Scotty to have his hair like that. So, yep, that's right. Um, Hong King, yeah, the worm, iconic, exactly. The worm is iconic. Thank you to the one and only.
the worm man, Scotty Too Hot in. All right, let's roll the tape. Instead of calling themselves too much now, they would become too cool instead, with the duo using this new wrinkle to their gimmicks to help them find they continued the success hat. in the tag team there division going forward. Of course, it wouldn't be until later on that oh, year hey, that they that really guy? unlocked the door to superstardom, as it was then that Rikishi Fatu would fall into their orbit, with the Samoan beginning to associate <laughs> himself with them at this time, as he saw something there that could give him the very boost he'd been looking for in his career. Oh, yes, free, prior free. to this, what do you mean, like, I saw something that I can get the very boost that I need for my career? Hold on one second, man. <clears throat> get your facts straight. First of all, I didn't need nobody to get my career boosted to the next level. Everything, like I just mentioned before, there are those behind the scene who they just felt that we can put blah, blah, blah together, maybe put this angle together, maybe put this talent with this talent. It's for a reason, okay? So if you ask me, let's go ahead and get your facts straight before you put it out there. All right, roll the tape. Rikishi had been a longtime mm -hmm. member of the WWE roster, starting his career there in 1992. There as he and his cousin Samu initially brought their old Samoan SWAT team gimmick from the Indies over, shout and branding out themselves from there as the Head Shrinkers, a team that would see them both become the scourge of the tag team division okay. for a while. <laughs> And after that had run its course oh, a few Lord. years later, Rikishi had difference. gone through a number of gimmick changes as he tried to find a foothold in his singles career. That's right. With these the including and Make a Difference Fatu and, and The Sultan. Right. But of Man, course, this. neither of these would really catch on with fans, and it wasn't until he started going back okay. to his roots okay. as Rikishi, an ass-kicking member of the famed Anawai'i family, that he would finally begin to gain some traction. Paul's and the final... It's not Anawai'i. Let me, let me go ahead and correct it. It is not on Hawaii, okay? Say Hawaii. Hawaii, everybody say Hawaii. I can hear you. <laughs> Hawaii, now just say on Hawaii. See the difference? On Hawaii, Hawaii, on Hawaii, Hawaii, not on Hawaii, okay? Roll the tape piece of this puzzle to make him the star he knew he could be would fall into place when he began associating with Too Cool soon after that as, hey, now having some of his own right personality there. added to his badass we persona, was zone, he man. started connecting with audiences in a huge way. But by then, all three well, men were beginning to with connect audience. with audiences, as after they'd finished with their matches, they'd taken to having regular dance parties in the ring, something which got over hey. huge with live crowds as the sight of a giant Samoan right, dancing Paul's ring. Dead. So you see this, you can see the difference from early on in our career until you come, come, and then you find something that works. And so, you know, the birth of this dancing here, you know, we always thought about, you know, you always see professional wrestling. I mean, for years and years, you see blah, 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 the person wins, you know, all of a sudden it's just this, and then boom, the person's out. So we, we thought about, man, why don't we just, you know, just switch it up? You know, how, how about, you know, I was already dancing anyway back in the day in Fisherman's Wharf on Pier 39. So I thought, about, hmm, what if we were, because you see two white boys and then you see a big blonde hip Samoan cat, right? You wouldn't think that we'd be able to bust a move. I said, what if we, instead of just us, they raise our hand, what if after we turn around and we just bust the move and just turn the whole arena into a big nightclub? You know, let's try that. And we tried that the first time. I think we tried it on uh, Sunday Night Heat back in the day. There was a show before Monday Night Raw. Um, we tried that, and people went crazy. Before you know it, I think that same night, we were on Monday Night Raw, and there was the birth of the Tuku Rikishi dance. Okay, Professor, what's happening? Professor Hart, my mom and pops used to love when y'all dance. Well, big shout out to mamas and pops, and big shout out to you too as well, Professor. Okay, who's this coach? Coach uh, Fluff, 2189. Uh, the Royal Rumble moment with Tuku and Rikishi dancing was always memorable. Yeah, you know, that's going to that's gonna definitely go down in history, um, in the history of the Royal Rumble books in itself, um, especially to be able to, make a memorable moment for, you know, not only us as Tupu, 
but for you, the fans, and do it in the most famous arena in the world, Madison Square Garden, it don't get no better than that. Okay, big shout out to Nike. Who's that? Nike ATL 21. I love how every generation of the Samoan dynasty blazes their own path to greatness. You know, um, that's a very good uh, uh, comment, but it's also a hard answer for me. You know, I, I guess uh, passion, uh, responsibility. Um, competition, the friendly competition, the culture, all that sums up to, you know, when we all make up our mind that whether we're going to, you know, we're going to jump into this industry, you know, you keep in mind all the bloodlines before us from high chief Peter Maivia, the uncle half and Zika, uh, the late mighty Yokozuna, you know, big Samu, you know, the rock, Umaga, you know, the Tonga kid, uh, you know, Reno and Hawaii, the Count Black Pearl. Uh, you know, the list goes on. And we have our new, the newer generation that are out now, Roman Reigns, the Usos, uh, Solo Sikoa, you know, Jacob Fatu, Journey Fatu, Lance on Hawaii, um, Alpha Junior that's out there. I mean, the list goes on and on. You know, there is so many that, that uh, in this bloodline, uh, Rosie, you know, RIP to cousin Matt. And forgive me if I forget somebody, it's just so many of us that are coming through. And it's always that, you know, those that come, you know, before us, like our uncles, you know, they always tell us this business is not a game. Uh, that if you're going to come into this business, that, you know, you need to, you know, make sure it's 100% what you want to do, give it 100% and go out there and just you know steal the show let your athletic ability you're going to train to be a pro you're going to train to understand the ins and outs of this industry and so you too can pave your own way and you too can you know be that role model for those you know coming up underneath you you know doesn't have to be our own family member but because we are on a worldwide stage we had a re responsibility uh, not only to our family, to our friends, our friends, to our fans, uh, to our culture, and you know, to to everyone in the world that that uh, you know uh, put eyes on the Samoan dynasty. And I hope you all are you know satisfied and happy of what you've seen through the years and today. You know, we all know that you know, you know, coming from this family here, it's uh, it's one hundred percent. Otherwise, we wouldn't touch it. Okay, let's roll the tape. He's around two dorky white boys, always got a chuckle and sent people home happy. <laughs> I got a call of yes, dorky in white boys. the era boys. where everyone else was trying to be an anti-hero, cool two cool boys. were going the opposite way. Oh, acting as a feel-good comedy Scotty. act okay. that could bring some variety to the show. I and like this the swag. huge as it happened they because the they soon after on. this, they would officially drop their heel weights, going babyface fully from there on yeah. in. After that, and they would begin adding even more crowd-pleasing moves to their arsenal as, with the worm now becoming one of the most over moves on the roster, right up yeah, there with the yeah, Stone Cold sudden, Stunner and the People's the Elbow, Rikishi decided this to add a new signature attack of his own, that oh, being look, the Stink look, Face. Who is that? Yes, That's the leader. sight of him driving his ass into a poor, unsuspecting victim every week quickly <laughs> became <laughs> one of the highlights of WWE TV during the Attitude Era, and this uh, only helped to get too cool even hey, more dude, over than they already were. And all this would arguably reach fresh. its peak when, during the 2000 Royal Rumble match on January 23rd of that year, in front of a pumped up 19,000 fans inside oh, Madison Square is. Garden, Rikishi and Grandmaster Sexay would find themselves the only two competitors in the ring at one point, so with it looking then history, like the big man Royal was Rumble. going to turn on his partner, all before the next Madison entrant was announced, Garden. Scotty Too Hotty himself. So, Looking to quell the situation, the New England native would race down to the ring Scotty with an extra pair of sunglasses in tow, as from there, he convinced his stablemates to take a break from all the fighting and relax for a oh. while instead. What followed was one of the most memorable rumble ball. spots in history when, right there in the middle of one of the biggest matches of the year, all night. three men would have a dance break, much to the delight of the live audience and the bemusement of Jim yeah. Ross on commentary who would state, 
folks, we've seen it all. We're going to dance for a little while. Picture right but of there. course, after the dancing was over, it oh, would be Rikishi man. who would dump both his partners over the top rope, something which they didn't seem right. too happy about initially, but quickly accepted as part of the every man for himself rules yeah, of the still match. Cool like that. still and cool proving like that, that they were still buddies after this, they would come together to take on the newly signed radicals, Chris Benoit, Dean Malenko, and Perry <laughs> Saturn, in a six-man tag match at the following month's No Way Out pay-per-view in uh. what ended up being a winning effort. And this victory would see them all be bumped further up the card afterwards as, at WrestleMania right, 16 on April 2nd, they would all appear in featured matches, albeit separate ones, as while Grandmaster Sexay and Scotty Tuhati were teaming so with China to once again seconds. defeat the Radicals. So those outfits, those are one of those iconic, iconic outfits that uh, that Scotty and Grandmaster were. So, you know, uh, they were made from Echo. Uh, before Echo was even born, the Echo the clothing brand out there in uh in new york city so big shout out to echo <laughs> you know uh they should we used to always uh get boxes and stuff you know because uh you know we were doing a hip-hop thing and you know back in the day echo didn't have my size so every time they would send a lot of stuff and i always have scotty and grandmaster size and, and so they would look fresh all the time every monday night raw and smackdown with new gears, but that one there, the white outfit with the jean jacket and the jean uh, uh, pants, that was probably one of my favorites there. So big shout out to Echo for lacing up too cool right there. I hope you guys are doing great. Matter of fact, if you're on my Twitch or my Instagram, you're following me, Echo, go ahead and hit your boy up. Time for us to link up again. All right, okay, here we go, roll the tape. You're in Scotty featured tape. matches, <laughs> albeit separate ones, as while well, Grandmaster Sexay and Scotty Tuhati were teaming with China to once again defeat the Radicals, this adding a further notch to their impressive and growing list of victories, hey, elsewhere on the show, Rikishi would be teaming with Kane to defeat two members of D-Generation X <laughs> in Road Dogg and X-Pac. Of course, this DX feud had been going on for a while by then, though, as acting as the top heel group in the company and the de facto authority figures for the show, the Degenerates had been making life a living hell for baby faces everywhere. So as one of the top baby yeah, face acts is. in the company by that point then, Too Cool would see it as their duty to try and get the better of them uh, at all terms, with the there's most there's memorable cool match that featured both sides probably coming on February 7th of that year, when the dancing trio got to be part of one of the most heated okay, main events in that match right there. So I want you guys to go back, uh, go ahead and put that screen up higher. Okay. This match here, it was me, Scotty, Too Hotty, Grandmaster, the rock and we also had mick foley you can't see mick foley here but uh this was chris benoit x pac uh triple h d malenko and i believe it was perry saturn when you guys get a second now this we're probably gonna bring this for the future but this here uh this match here was probably uh it was a monday night raw i can't remember but this was the first time we all uh, mixed it up together five on five and in professional wrestling you go ahead and put me back up on the screen in professional wrestling whenever you go out to arena there's what we call a pop it's either a loud pop or a small pop if it's a small pop or barely no pop that means they don't give a damn but if it's a loud pop the fans are just you know like you know roaring and just going crazy that's a good sign meaning that the fans are engaged into this match this match here is probably the only match that i've ever been a part of as when we came out the relevant position as soon as they seen the whole crew all five of us together it was so loud from the beginning to match of the match all the way to the finish of the match it was so freaking loud in there like you can barely hear us in there doing our thing. And I, I wanna, you know, I'm gonna have my guy do the research and we're gonna come back because I wanna show this full match. And this match here, yeah, I wanna critique on it. And I think it's important for you guys to understand and know what my feelings was during this match leading up to this match. Okay, roll the tape. Raw history when they teamed with The Rock and Mick Foley to take on Triple H, X-Pac, and the Radicals in a bout that showed the true depth of star power that was on the roster at the time and had fans right. going wild at every star turn. Power. 
Soon after this career high, however, oh, the they go to Michael Jackson. The That's the name of that dance. Christopher oh, suffered yet he another named it injury. Michael Jackson. That said, once again, not content to let their momentum die Pick down, the while world, his partner man. was out recuperating, Scotty Tuhati would re-enter singles competition in the light heavyweight division, even becoming light heavyweight champion for a time after he defeated Dean Malenko at April 30th's Backlash in a match that's probably amongst the most underrated of the entire Attitude Era. Uh, so with this keeping the group fresh in people's minds then, when their injured partner was ready to come back in May, all three would pick up right where they left off, finishing up their feud with the Radicals at this point, then moving on okay. to a six-man tag. Kishi Black backflip from the clothesline was the best around. Big shout out to Vino uh, Richie 84 Thank you, my man. That was, uh, <laughs> that was uh, a lot of practice. You know, when you're 450 pounds and you're trying to, it's called 360. Right. So when you, somebody hits you with a clothesline, you try to, you know, have yourself kind of flip upside down. Right. And for a while there, I tried to try damn near broke my neck, uh, you know, injured my neck many a time, like a stinger and so forth. But I was so determined to get that move because I wanted something that can record, you know, me to be recognized my athletic ability. Because when they see for all those big dudes or big women that are out there, Embrace, embrace what you, you know, embrace your body. You know, you're, you're made that way for a different, uh, for a reason. I mean, you're made that way for a reason. So I always felt like, you know what? They look at us like we're slow. They look at us like, do they expect us to be slow, can't move, where you know we're not athletic, and all that. So I, you know, whenever somebody says that to me, you know, I'm on a mission. I'm on a mission to prove. You know, prove to myself that is he right or, or is he wrong? And then, you know, I'll, I'll keep practicing, keep practicing. And finally, when I came up with that, I'm probably the only big guy in professional wrestling to do the 360 and did the 360 the first time. So thank you very much. Big shout out to all our big people, you know, healthy, thick people that are out there in the world. Keep doing you. Roll the tape. With Kurt Angle, Edge, and Christian at that month's Judgment Day pay-per-view where, in a moment that pleased the paying audience, they would once again pick up the win. After that victory, the team, minus Rikishi, would even get to challenge Edge and Christian for the WWE Tag Team titles on the May 29th episode of Raw. And while at this point the heel champs oh, were riding a, a career match, high too. of their own, helping to redefine the tag good team work, division good. at every turn. On that shout night, out to Edge it would be Christian. too cool who would get the better of them, oh, man, as they became man, the top JC, tag team in the compete. division for a while. That was a good cat right there, man. But that wasn't the only success they were having at this time, as on the June 20th episode of SmackDown, Rikishi hey, would hey. pin Chris Benoit after a hard-fought battle to become the Intercontinental uh, Champion, too. With this okay, marking the trio... Okay, pause that. This, this, you see these guys, I just won the belt. Knowing damn well I'm tired, right? I blowed up. And then what did they do? They come... Grandmaster putting all his weight on me, messing my hair back up. And so they both were trying to rip me during the time. And I was telling them, get the hell off of me. You know, get the hell off of me. I'm blown up and so forth. All right, roll the tape. Jokes. Those Two high points as, jokes. as for a brief moment there, right in the midst of one of the most stacked rosters in history, they dominated the upper mid card. There goes some more echo outfits. And having to keep up their duties of defending these newly won titles then, they would splinter off into separate programs for a while following this as, uh, at June 25th's King of the Ring, Grandmaster Sexay and Scotty Tuhati would be part of a fatal four-way elimination match for the WWE Tag Team titles, which eventually saw them lose their belts back to Edge and Christian, too while cool in the King of the Ring tournament itself, Rikishi she would make it all the way to the finals, defeating Chris Benoit and Val Venus before finally falling to Kurt Angle in the finals. Yes, while well, he yeah, did an well, admirable job went of making it to the last uh, hurdle, in the, the end, level. the momentum of the Olympic hero was just too much for Rikishi to overcome. And if he thought the bad times were going to end there, then he was very wrong, because at fully loaded on July 23rd, the champ now, would fail to defend second. the... Back up just a little bit. Just a little bit. Wait, Rikishi's holding the belt while I'm holding the belt right there. Now, listen here. Tell me, don't that don't that belt look good on my shoulder? To the last hurdle, in the end, the momentum of the Olympic hero was just too much for Rikishi to overcome. 
And if he thought the bad times were going to end there, <laughs> then he was very wrong. Because at full load on July 23rd, There's the champ would right fail there. to defend the Intercontinental title during a steel cage oh. match with Val Venus. With big two shout out to from Big there Val. relegated to Val acting Volsky. as the curtain jerker in August SummerSlam, where they would lose to Right to Censor in the opening match of the night. Oh, man, God, After Stevie that, Rich. things would collapse even further when in October oh, of that year, that Rikishi was revealed right to there. have been the man who ran over the Steve Austin man. the year prior. Kayfabe causing his neck injury as, in one of the most disappointing reveals in WWE history, he told fans everywhere that he did it for The Rock. But of course, a major part line. of the reason this was so disappointing was that All by the then, was Rikishi the was so line. over as a fun-loving babyface that no one wanted to boo him. Still, I believing that if he wanted to get the full main event push, he would have to change his character up, Vince McMahon persisted with this decision anyway. And so, from there on, the big man would separate himself from the rest of Too Cool, with them now limping on as a tag team for a while, seemingly neutered now that a key part of their act was missing. Wow. And it's not as if Rikishi's solo run went that much better as, after a few months of trying and failing to get him over as a monster heel in his matches against the likes of Stone Cold, The Rock, as well as giving him a big bump at the six-man Hell in a Cell hey, match at December 10th, Armageddon, this guy about? the boss... Yeah, the bump you took uh, getting tossed off the Hell in a Cell was crazy. That's right, Coach, uh, what's it, Coach Fluff, 2189. Yeah, it, it was, uh, you know, and it hurts. Uh, I don't recommend anybody to try that bump if you're not professionally trained for it. But it's what we do as performers, as uh, professional wrestlers, as uh, entertainers. Uh, when you get out there, you know, you know, you know, people pay hard-earned money. Uh, they come watch you perform. So, you know, at any given time, you know, these type of opportunities can come towards you know, you as a performer and, you know, you got to think twice. Nobody forces you to, to do anything. You know, you, you can either take the bump or not take the bump, you know, but if you're trained professionally, right. And you, uh, you have uh, uh, faith in your training and, you know, you, you know, you can pull that, that bump, you know, off because, uh, you know, why not? Why not go ahead and take it? Uh, but at the end of the day, know that things can happen, you know, um, that bump there could end my life. Had something went wrong or, you know, not hit the correct spot in the middle of that of that uh, uh, flatbed that came out, yeah, we probably wouldn't be sitting here today talking to me on Twitch. But, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm grateful and I'm thankful that I'm still here today with you all. So God is good. All right, let's roll the tape. You would give up on the whole endeavor completely, relegating him man. instead to a tag team with Haku as he good. failed Thank to you, even man. make it on the WrestleMania card the following year. Of course, the sensible thing to do after this then would have been to try and salvage things by reuniting Too Cool once more. However, this ultimately wasn't possible as, at that point, Scotty Too Hotty had taken some time uh, off to go and get neck surgery. As each tried to rebuild themselves over the next couple of years from there, they would all be met with their own individual difficulties. Grandmaster Sexe, for his part, would move back over to the indie circuit, there finding work in his father's promotion in Memphis once more, and at the one point even getting a job with man. TNA. Cool. Meanwhile, as this yes, was sir. happening, Rikishi's yes, heel right, turn would continue to falter, with him eventually being forced to turn babyface once again in late 2001. <laughs> that said, aside from one notable match against Hulk Hogan oh, on an episode of SmackDown the following year, he would remain face. largely when underutilized. Any moment. So that 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 match there was, I think it was a little uh, screenshot with Hulk Hogan. So that was in, uh, I believe that was in Tampa, Florida, someplace, and um, he was that was a house show, and that was the first time the Rikishi character mixed it up with the Hulk star. Yeah, I was a little kid back in the day. We all were, you know, when we used to watch Hulk to do his thing, and then, you know, years fast forward years later. You know, here it is that Hogan's coming back during the time when Rikishi was hot, and they paired us two up in his hometown in Tampa, Florida. And uh, when I got the, the cue that I was going to stink face this guy, I was kind of nervous. You know, I mean, yeah, he, you know, you know, stink face, you know, the Hulkster. The Hulkster is the one that kind of you know, paved the way back in the day for a lot of people. You know, even guys like myself, and, you know, they used to mix it up with my uncles off in Sika. You know, uh, 
late Jimmy Superfly Snooker, you know, a lot of the family, Haku, Tonga Kid, a lot, a lot of family members, Samu, you know, way before me. And then to find out that, you know, I was going to stink face this guy, he took it like a champ. You know, I made sure that night that I had me a clean damn thong before I <laughs> before I stink faced the hulkster. Do you have any Haku stories you can tell us or you can save for another time? I'll save that for another time. I like to highlight certain people. Tonight, we're just you know, talking about too cool. All right, let's roll the tape. ...match against Hulk Hogan on an episode of SmackDown the following year, he would mm -hmm. remain largely underutilized. Any momentum he once had now having dissipated into nothing. So Thank luckily goodness. then, when Scotty Tuhati returned uh -oh, from there injury goes in October of 2003, both men got a lifeline when they began teaming up once more, carrying Look, on the two cool legacy, Scotty. even if their third member said? was no longer with them. Well, he and knows during a this lot. run, they would find some success together, even becoming WWE Tag Team Champions yeah. again after defeating the Basham Brothers on the February 5th, yeah. well, 2004 edition of the Blue Is Brand. The lifeline? Still, it was clear to everyone watching by that, then they had that the moment had passed to put the and the magic on. which had made them so special was long gone. That was why, come the summer of that year, they would have lost the titles and Rikishi would have been released from the company altogether, with Scotty following him no, out the door a couple of years later in May of 2007. Let's get that right. After that, the original two members of the stable would briefly reunite on the indie circuit, competing yeah. in the UWF's Live Rock and Express Tag Team Tournament on July 19th of that year. But that wouldn't be the only too cool reunion around this time as it happened, because in 2009, Grandmaster Sexay and Rikishi right, would that. So here, this match here, uh, this here was spearheaded by Knox Pro Entertainment. And we got together with Eric Bischoff, and you had two Samoans behind the scene here. This was the, the trip back home in Australia. Um, we work with uh, some close friends of ours uh, that are out there to be able to make this happen out in Australia. We did five uh, different uh, big cities out there. But uh, this match here, this was, a, uh, I believe, Scotty was in, was still with the office, I think. And uh, these were a lot of independents. You know, back in the day, people got released. And so we book all those, you know, those that are not on the contract. As you can see, my late brother Umana is there, you know, and... Uh, a good friend Orlando Jordan's right there and Grandmaster Sexy. And this was in, I believe this was in Sydney. This was the last show we had out of a five week tour. And, uh, you know, me and uh, Brian, you know, we, you know, we really, you know, got some time to kind of really, really catch up, you know, after being, you know, you can see our history through this footage here. Um, uh, that was played, uh, you know, while we're watching this, but this was kind of towards the towards the end of ending part here, and uh, of uh, of us being together, um, and we had so much fun, you know. And and what I'm saying is, whenever you get a chance, you know, like, you know, sometimes you're so busy you're working together and blah blah blah, you never really have that downtime, you not only for yourself, for your good friends or your family members, uh, if you're in the same industry or you know, work together every day, make time to, you know, take time to uh, spend some time together just, you know, without, you know, talking about business or anything, but just just to catch up, you know, how's he doing and, you know, how's your family doing and, and sit over some good food and have what I say, what I like to call some quality time. But big shout out to Knox Pro Entertainment uh, for spearheading this thing here. I mean, uh, you can go on my YouTube, you'll see it there where, you know the back scenes of how this uh, uh, this tour unfolded. You know, uh, we did a lot of commercials and so forth, and booked most of the talent that are on there. So, you know, big shout out to uh, my uh, my uh, my younger brother there, Umaga. You know, Ekifatu, love you, man. All right, roll the tape. Also team up together again as part of Hulk Hogan's Hulkamania Let the Battle Begin tour right. of Australia. Seven years later, and all three men would finally return to WWE when, wow. as part of Old School Raw on January 6, 2014, they would show up to take on 3MB in a winning effort, with this marking the first time in 13 years that the trio had shared the ring together again. And following mm. on from the success of this reunion, Hottie and Sexay would go over to NXT to challenge for that brand's tag team titles in a one-off appearance too. 
with this creating a nice moment of nostalgia that reminded yeah. fans that, for Look a period of trade. time, they were amongst the most over Roll and ball. most fun acts on a roster that was All right. no, roll the stacked with them from top to bottom. Sadly, though, any future reunions are now impossible. As in July of 2018, Brian Christopher would commit suicide while in police custody, something which his father would go on to file a lawsuit against the police department over. You know that what? tragedy aside, though, Scott Taylor would find a better path uh, when he underwent a change of career, becoming a firefighter for a time. All this before he eventually uh, returned to WWE as a trainer in 2016. And as for Rikishi, well, after his Hall of Fame induction in 2015, his legacy has continued to live on in the form of his children, Jimmy and Jay Uso, who have gone on to become one of the most decorated is. tag teams in WWE history. So, while it's sad that all three of them couldn't have gotten a happy ending, at least Scotty and Rikishi have been able to continue to create a future for themselves regardless. And even though Brian Christopher is no longer with us, he lives on in our memories Rest as we can peace, always fire friend. up the WWE Network Rest and look back love. at all the great things both he and the rest of Too Cool did during that three-year period where, cool when trip, wrestling sure was at right its there. hottest and everyone was watching, they proved that all you really had to do in order to make people happy for a while was to dance. Bust a move. Well, guys. Well, we you know what? There you have it. You know, let me uh, uh, kind of commentate on this cat's here's uh, who's uh, video and this is uh, Russell with Andy. Uh, subscribe on his YouTube. Okay, uh, uh, big shout out to Andy for uh, putting that together. But Andy, get your freaking facts straight. Do your research. You know you're you're commentating over your video as if you were there. You know, understand this. Not everything you guys read on the internet is true. And if you're reading all this stuff from Wikipedia, well. Do your research again you know there's a lot of things that's that's uh invalid uh, uh on some of these videos that are being you know shown here and you know what i show these videos uh you know just to be able to you know critique on some of it and you know yeah i'm going to say my opinion uh what i feel uh to those that are making these type of videos and you know big shout out to you you know i think it's fun for us to you know, we can all, you know, watch these type of videos of uh, myself, uh, some of my friends, uh, some of those that are, you know, your fan favorite, uh, where you can hear uh, Hall of Famers critiques uh, some of these uh, films that are on here. So I hope you guys are digging this thing here. You know, it's, uh, you know, it's something new for me for Twitch, and I'm glad that we're able to uh, kind of link up together like this. Yeah. Man, I always wanted one of those Rikishi wear jackets. Man, soon. You know, those jackets there, uh, Paul King, they were made special, um, you know, uh, by uh, a young lady who, who's uh, the WWE seamstress is uh, Terry Anderson. All right. So she, big shout out to Terry if you're watching this. Thank you so much. I miss you. Thank you for making Big Keish look fly back in the day with the bad guy Rikishi wear. Okay, who's that dynamite? Uh, 1985. What if it was you beat the Rock for WWE Championship, not Mankind? How would you? How would your WWE Championship run? Went? Well, I think it. You know, I know it would have won. Uh, went. Uh, ran. Great. You know, to be able to, I would probably want the storyline to be long. You know, against you know myself and family member of the Rock. You know, I think it's, uh, you know, uh, be, could be a good match. I know it'll be a good match. Uh, the chemistry is there. You know, um, of course, uh, I'd have to be the bad, bad guy because Rock is such a fan favorite and is such a, you know, a huge, huge draw uh, just to be in the ring with a, a person at that magnitude. Uh, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's an honor. But to be able to, you know, know that it's also your family member, it's even a greater honor because now you have the bloodline versus the bloodline, Samoan dynasty versus Samoan dynasty, you know, the cultures that was won. And here we are doing it on a big stage. You know, would have been nice to be, you know, have it done on WrestleMania. But as we say in the industry, the wheel turns. And here you go 20 years later, the bloodline stands. Okay, next question. Who we got here? That designer did some good work. 
Oh, uh, yeah, he sure did. She sure did. Terry did. Imagine if you join three minute warning. <laughs> yeah, that that would be that would have been a hell of a team. It would have been nice to to experience the ring, you know, uh, you know, with my younger brother and my cousin, Matt, who is Rosie, you know, both of them are, as we all know today, are deceased, you know, gone too soon. Um, but, you know, we we haven't experienced the ring together uh, as a tag or on the same team in the WWE. Uh, but back in the day when we first training in the backyard with Uncle Sika and Uncle Alpha, you know, when there was no cameras around, just, you know, us, we would train out in the back ring uh, with, uh, you know, uh, cousin Rodney Yokozuna, cousin Big Sam, Samu, uh, you know, my cousin Reno on Hawaii and my younger brother, the Tonka kid. You know, the, pretty much the whole crew, you know, all the, all the younger ones that are here today, they were all like real, you know, babies running around in diapers back in the day. So, okay. Uh, to roughly enjoy the young rock show. Hopefully we can see you portrayed on there soon. I think, you know, uh, a big shout out to the rock show. Yeah, they're he's they're getting good good feedback and you know now they're on uh, uh, another season I believe it is correct, um, but you know yes uh, you know a, a friend of mine that plays the you know the the sheik on there, uh, Brett Barr, he's uh, he's actually on there and uh, he actually gave me a heads up I guess the, that the new scene of uh, The Rock versus uh, The Sultan with The Sheik, I think, is going to be airing. So he, he was just, you know, telling me how fun it was to kind of, you know, learn the, uh, uh, to you know, how Iron Sheik was. And boy, you, you need a whole lifetime to learn who Iron Sheik is, you know, in and out the ring. And uh, Sheik was just, a, you know, uh, a big help to me during the time to trying to learn how to, how to you know, portray that assaulting character because I wanted to come full circle. You know, I wanted to really understand, you know, the culture of Middle Eastern, uh, the, what their food is, you know, what, you know, what type of, you know, swag and, you know, you know, that they, uh, uh, that they all like, you know, the, the culture and, and uh, you know, having cheek with me that, like, you know, kind of helped me do that. But <laughs> there was a lot of beer drinking too back in the day. <laughs> they want to know. Okay, I believe this is the one here we're going to tap on into. Uh, this is uh, Gang Grill, the vampire warrior. So let me tell you, uh, you know, about uh, David Heath. David Heath is a very, very, uh, you know, one good professional wrestler. Uh, been in the industry for a while. He knows his shit you know, in, in and out of the squared circle. Um, David Heath Gangrel, the vampire warrior, uh, has been around my family uh, for many a years, been trained with my family for many a years. You know, he's one of my mother's favorite. You know, my mother has passed away. And whenever David would come over to the house, you know, my mom would always tell David, you know, you know, she would always have some food cooked and tell David, uh, David's so polite and so respectful. He wouldn't want to eat because he didn't want to come eat anybody's food. And my mom would always make, you know, food when no one's, he comes over. And he would, she would have him a lava lava, which is those skirt sarongs that you guys see, that you see female wears on the beach. Well, Polynesian men, we wear that at home, and we call it a lava lava. Uh, and would have him a, a towel. So when he comes, he goes to the room. You know, he has his stuff there, but she, he was one of my mother's favorite. Now, Dave has, uh, you know, he has his show here uh, that, you know, we're going to watch here in a second. And I'm going to critique uh, some of the things that, you know, on his show. And I'm a big fan of, of uh, you know, David. You know, back when Gang Grill was uh, uh, with the brood, that right there, and we're probably going to have to look for a YouTube that's out there so we can uh, kind of chit chat about that. But, you know, as, as we see the two cool video here, what this guy here, Andy, supposedly what his research 
Had we had had a run, Rikishi and Too Cool versus Gangrel, Edge, and Christian as the brood, I guarantee you they would have sold arenas out anywhere in the world if it was done the right way. Because they came out, man, that's probably the best freaking entrance. You know, when I first seen them come up with the fire up underneath the stage, you know, it reminded me of the, like the Lost Boys. You know, they had that cool, evil, just look. And then you had Rikishi and Too Cool. You had those guys there. They had that cool, innocent look. And I always, you know, you think evil, good and evil. You know that that draws right there so you know that's probably a dream match that i wish it would have happened and it, it would have been great to have an angle to work with a lot of those pros right there but let's go ahead and roll the tape for david if you guys haven't followed road Gangrel, stories with rikishi and make others sure you follow it on instagram <laughs> <laughs> like road stories there's tons and tons of uh, uh oh my goodness there's tons of stories okay uh, I could tell you that I've never seen mayonnaise. I, like they were off mayonnaise for a while, but I, I noticed this weekend they're back on the mayonnaise again. They're putting mayonnaise on. Uh, they're, 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 like they had tuna fish with mayonnaise, but then they put like they squeezed mayonnaise on it. But I never knew that there were so many uses for mayonnaise in my life. So I literally started putting mayonnaise on my rice, my white rice. Really? I put mayonnaise on my white rice. I put Support mayonnaise steroid. on my scrambled eggs. What I put happened? mayonnaise on everything. But what mayonnaise did for me is put I used to weight on my ass and everything. I went up to 305 pounds on mayonnaise, like hanging out with him in LA. Well, I mean, I was drinking too. Drinking has something to do with it. Like I was drinking. But like I'm like 245, 250 now. Uh, but yeah, I was 305 pounds in LA. And I blame it mostly on the mayonnaise. And bad, bad, bad lifestyle, but... It was mostly that mayonnaise. They okay. put, I mean, there's turkey tail, and everything. But um, uh, <laughs> Samoans, the culture, uh, you travel with them. Once, you, once you're in with them, your family, whatever it is, your family, you're considered family. You you Love attend you, funerals, David. weddings, mm -hmm. <laughs> everything together. So very cultural driven, very family driven, very loyal. Um, but it, it, no it, if you break that circle of trust. Oh. You are alienated, and and there's like a death squadron sent for you. You know, Freeze you know right how many there. Samoans there are. You know, um, I can tell you this. Okay, you just heard it right from, you know, the legend, the icon himself, Gangrel. We're good people, blah blah blah, but you cross us, that's where the line is drawn right there. You're definitely not only Samoans. I'm talking about the whole. If you got Polynesian friends in general, Polynesians, like every single person in Polynesian it's our culture, we're happy, go lucky, good people, give you the shirt off our back. I mean, we'll embrace you as family. But once you cross and that trust is broken in that circle, goodbye. You know, you definitely, I mean, it's not only a goodbye. It might be a goodbye six feet deep. Goodbye with a swollen eye. Goodbye with a fat lip. <laughs> you know, it's goodbye. It's just good goodbye. So never, never, ever, ever cross a Polynesian. All right, roll the tape. So, all right, here's the one. But I, I don't want to go into a lot of detail because I don't want anybody to go to prison. Um, um, okay. So uh, we were in Australia and uh, we did a show. It was coming to the end of, end of the loop, right? And it was uh, a nice pro entertainment show. We hadn't got paid. Uh, uh -oh. You know, if you know Samoans and the coupe, their money. Samoans oh, no, no, gonna get their another, money. That that, that's if I learned anything when I was was at office school and then ended up running office school, it's business. The Samoans gonna get their money. You owe them money. They're gonna get their money. So it's the end of the trip, and we we're supposed to fly home. I'm not sure if they changed their flight to a later flight or not, whatever. Yeah, we did. We changed it. But what I learned is Samoans have family on every planet continent okay. state <laughs> it doesn't matter where you are there is a herd of samoan somewhere just waiting on go yeah. like psh, we'll find that bat we'll Samoan go. We'll like and uh and they sent out a crew like i don't know what they did i i do know what they did but i don't want to say it out loud like okay. there was some holes put in a house somewhere but by that afternoon Every last one of us got paid, and <laughs> we're on that evening flight out of there. Like so, it's insane. It's, um, yeah, but yeah. So like, if you're, you're in their circle of trust, don't breach it because if you you're out of it, 
<laughs> I can't guarantee what will happen to you, man. But I, I love um, – I mean, I, I OG'd in with uh, Alpha and then, then – um, you know, I traveled a lot with Samu and 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 fought Junior Akishi, and then I was like best friends for the longest time with uh, Reno Hawaii, the Council California, Black Pearl. Like, and that's <laughs> crazy, man. They are so oh, gangster. So this here, this is uh, just a PSA to all the promoters out there, or just anybody that does business with my family, the Samoan Dynasty. Make sure when you do business. You don't cross the line. You fulfill your obligations. It's with utmost respect and always first class from A to Z. There, you've been warned. 